For decades, we have been taught that fluoride protects teeth. Well, that's true, but only when it is used in safe amounts. Our enamel is primarily made up of hydroxyapatite crystals, which can break down under acid attacks, leading to cavities. When fluoride is present, it replaces hydroxyapatite with fluoroapatite, which is a stronger, more acid-resistant mineral that helps protect against decay. However, when too much fluoride is consumed, it can disrupt this process, leading to dental fluorosis, an early sign of fluoride toxicity. But the bad news is, fluoride overuse doesn't only affect teeth, it can also cause skeletal and non-skeletal fluorosis. Skeletal fluorosis occurs when excess fluoride accumulates in bones over many years, leading to changes in bone structure. Knee pain is often an early symptom of skeletal fluorosis. As it progresses, it can lead to limb, hand, and spinal abnormalities, increased bone density, and even spinal cord compression. Non-skeletal fluorosis impacts soft tissues and organs. Chronic high fluoride exposure affects metabolism and organ function, potentially leading to neurological issues, thyroid dysfunction, and kidney problems. Now coming to the third type of fluorosis, which is related to your teeth and is known as dental fluorosis, is the most visible form of fluorosis ever. It is a developmental enamel condition caused by excessive fluoride intake during tooth development. I repeat, it affects enamel only and during tooth development. Since it affects enamel only, it can also be called enamel fluorosis or mottled enamel. If we look at the pathophysiology of dental fluorosis, during the transition and early maturation stages of enamel development, ameloblasts lay down a protein-rich matrix primarily composed of amelogenin. Normally, this matrix undergoes controlled breakdown, allowing calcium and phosphate to be incorporated, forming highly mineralized enamel crystals. Excessive fluoride ingestion disrupts this process by interfering with ameloblast function delaying protein breakdown and mineral deposition. As a result, enamel proteins are retained within the enamel structure, causing hypomineralized enamel to form, leading to dental fluorosis. This enamel is more porous and structurally weak, leading to characteristic white opacities, staining and in severe cases, pitting and enamel loss. The risk period for dental fluorosis occurs from birth until around 8 years of age, while the crowns of permanent teeth are still developing. However, after this age, fluoride no longer affects enamel development. Instead, it provides topical benefits by strengthening existing enamel, promoting remineralization, and increasing acid resistance. And this is why topical fluoride in toothpaste, mouthwash, and professional treatments is both safe and effective in preventing cavities as long as it is used appropriately. Fluorosis, as we said, occurs due to excess fluoride intake during tooth development. Major fluoride sources include fluoridated tap water, which has above 1.5 parts per million of fluoride, or naturally high fluoride groundwater. Fluoride-rich foods, high fluoride toothpaste if swallowed especially by children, infant formula mixed with fluoridated water, industrial pollution in certain regions and in high exposure areas excessive fluoride intake can lead to endemic fluorosis affecting large populations. Looking at the clinical presentation of dental fluorosis, fluorosis is dose dependent. The higher the fluoride intake during tooth development, the more severe the condition will be. Its severity is influenced by fluoride dose, duration and timing of exposure. Fluorosis can be mild, moderate or severe. Mild fluorosis, as shown in this graph, affects the larger portion of the global population compared to moderate or severe fluorosis. While mild fluorosis may still offer some protection against cavities, moderate and severe fluorosis can leave teeth weaker and more vulnerable to decay. Mild cases appear as subtle, lacy white markings that are barely noticeable. Moderate cases appear as more distinct, opaque white areas 
often accompanied by staining due to increased enamel porosity which allows pigments from food, beverages and bacteria to be trapped over time. Severe cases show extensive opacity, brown discoloration, pitting and enamel loss. While less common and less studied in primary teeth, dental fluorosis in primary teeth can occur typically due to high maternal fluoride intake during pregnancy as fluoride can cross the placenta and affect the developing primary teeth as well. Primary teeth are generally less susceptible as most of their development occurs post-birth when direct fluoride exposure becomes more relevant. In areas with high fluoride concentrations in drinking water, all primary teeth can be affected. However, fluorosis is usually more noticeable in the later erupting primary teeth particularly the primary second molars, which develop over a longer period and are exposed to fluoride for a more extended time. Talking about the management and treatment options, mild cases of fluorosis can be treated with microabrasion or teeth whitening. Moderate cases can be treated with resin infiltration or composite bondings. And severe cases can be treated with much extensive treatment options such as veneers or full coverage crowns. To address the increasing prevalence of dental fluorosis and its potential impact on aesthetics and quality of life, several recommendations have been made to reduce systemic fluoride exposure while maintaining its benefits for caries prevention. The key recommendations include revising fluoride supplement guidelines to limit use only to children at high risk of dental caries, using low fluoride or bottled water when reconstituting infant formula to reduce fluoride intake in early childhood, limiting toothpaste use in young children by applying only a small age-appropriate amount to minimize fluoride ingestion, adjusting the optimal fluoride concentration in drinking water to a level that balances caries prevention with a lower risk of fluorosis based on local fluoride exposure from other sources. These recommendations aim to reduce fluorosis risk while ensuring continued protection against tooth decay considering the various sources of fluoride exposure in daily life. I hope this video helps. If you think this video was really helpful, please do like, subscribe, share and comment if you have any questions. Thank you for watching.